Hello and welcome back. This is our third video lecture on optimization and in the previous lecture we discussed about convex unconstrained optimization problems. In fact we stated this very useful result that states that if we have a function f which is convex and smooth namely continuously differentiable then the set of stationary points of f is equal to the set of minimizers of f. This means, in very simple words, that if you can solve this equation, if you can determine a stationary point, then you have determined a minimizer. In fact, this is how you can determine a minimizer. And this equation might be, in fact, easy to solve, as is the case here, in the case of an unconstrained quadratic problem. This is called a quadratic problem because the cost function is quadratic, it says minimize one half x prime plus qx and so on and so forth. And we have assumed that Q is a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. By doing so, we know that the function is convex. How is that? We define this cost function and we take the Hessian of this function, which is equal to Q, it is equal to the matrix Q, which as we said is positive semi-definite and that's why the function is convex so we have a convex function all right that's perfect therefore since it's since it is also a smooth function we can determine a stationary point we can take the gradient and set it equal to zero and if we can solve this equation we can determine a minimizer now we will ask whether all optimization problems have a minimizer the answer is negative. Not all optimization problems have a minimizer. For example, we don't even have to resort to anything very, very complicated or non-convex. A convex problem is not guaranteed to have a minimizer or even an optimal value. This one here is what we call an unbounded problem. Have a look. Take the function f of x is equal to x. You cannot find any, uh, you cannot take a horizontal line such that your whole function, your whole cost function is above this line. This means that the, the cost function doesn't have a lower bound, and of course, needless to say, it doesn't have an infimum. This problem, minimize x, where x is a real number, is like asking for the smallest real number. There is no such a thing because the real numbers extend to minus infinity. You cannot find the smallest real number. This is what we call an unbounded problem. Then, on the other hand, boundedness, so the opposite of unboundedness, the fact that you can draw a horizontal line and have your whole function above that horizontal line, doesn't imply that we have a minimizer. Let me give you an example. Take this optimization problem, the, uh, the problem of minimizing the exponential function, where x is a real number. The optimal value now is 0. Why? Because if you take this horizontal line here, you can keep your whole function above 0, and in fact, this is the largest of your lower bounds. This is the highest you can put a horizontal line and keep your whole function above it. The largest lower bound is known as the infimum. This is the infimum of e to the power x. It is equal to zero. But roughly speaking, this zero is only attained, so to speak, at minus infinity. The only way that e to the power x is equal to zero is if x is equal to minus infinity. In other words, you cannot solve this equation. That's what I'm trying to say. There is no particular value of x. There is no finite value of x that solves this equation. The minimum is not attained. The function has an infimum. It doesn't have a minimum. We have no minimizers. This is a convex problem, really. This is a convex function. The take-home message is that if you have a convex problem, 
don't rush into the conclusion that the function has an infimum or that it has a minimizer. It might not be the case. And here are two very, very simple examples. f of x is equal to x is unbounded. f of x is equal to the exponential of x is bounded but has no minimizers. And this is a useful thing to keep in mind. Next, not all optimization problems have a minimizer. Not all of them have a, an infimum. And this is also true for convex problems as well. So I'm repeating the same thing, but it's important to keep it in, to keep it in mind. It is natural to ask under what conditions does an optimization problem have a minimizer. To do so, we need to uh, state one definition, that of a level set. Let me just say at this point that this part, from, from this point and until the end of this, sec this section, this part is not examinable. Nevertheless, it's interesting, so I thought I should include it in case you're uh, curious about under what conditions an optimization problem has a minimizer. So let's have a look. We need to define this entity. It is called a level set. We define the level set of f at level a. Let's not look at the equation. Let's look here. Let's take this level a. This is just a value on the vertical axis. It is a real number. Now take this value a and find all those x's here, all those x's such that the function is below a below a so what are the x's for which the function is below this ceiling and clearly these are these values so this is called the level set at level a for example take f of x is equal to x squared as in the plot and let's ask what is the level set at level 4 of f this is all the x's, which are real numbers, such that f of x is less than equal 4, lovely, which is all the x's, which are real numbers, such that x squared is less than equal 4, which is equal to the set from minus 2 to plus 2. It is this interval. And we're asking now whether these level sets are bounded. So this level set here from minus 2 to 2 is a bounded set. Why? Because it doesn't extend to infinity. Uh, to give you a proper definition, a proper definition of what a bounded set is, we say that a set C, which can be in fact a subset of the set of vectors because x is often a vector not just a number so a set of vectors is called bounded if i can put it inside a ball if there is a radius let's call it m such that I can take my set C and I can put it inside the ball of radius M. And let me sketch a couple of examples. Take this set C. It's non-convex, but that's okay. This set C is bounded because I can put it inside this ball. Let me give you now a counter example. Take this set, which extends to infinity. This is not a bounded set. Why? Because whatever ball you take, as large as you may take it, uh, the set will always escape and go outside this ball. So you cannot put it inside the ball. It is too large to put it inside the ball. So this is a, the second one here. This one is unbounded. This is a bounded set. Now, why are we mentioning level sets? As you might have guessed, this is exactly the criterion we're looking for level uh, bounded level sets level bounded functions once again a function is said to be level bounded if all of its level sets are bounded and of course they can be empty but that's absolutely fine 
they cannot be too large that's what we're saying so have a look at the plot over here for different values of a we get different level sets they can be small like this one they can be larger like this one but the question is whether they are bounded let's see an example where the level sets are unbounded so in this function exponential of minus x we have unbounded sets in this function we have bounded sets now there is this very useful result that states that if x is a set of vectors it is in an non empty closed set of vectors and f is a cost function which is continuous and it is level bounded so these are only these are the two only qualifications we will impose on the cost function we want it to be continuous and level bounded nothing else then in that case the infimum is finite and the argmin the set of minimizers is non empty that's beautiful why not a non empty set of minimizers means that we have minimizers we have some minimizers maybe just one but at least one and it's also compact which means closed and bounded but the important thing is that it is non-empty we have a minimizer note that it doesn't say this statement doesn't say that uh, if the function is not level bounded then there are no minimizers so you can have functions which are not level bounded but still the, you have minimizers the second thing to note here is that convexity is not mentioned anywhere so we don't say that the function needs to be convex we only have as i said two qualifications one is that the function must be continuous and the second one is that the function is level bounded so if you want to tell whether an optimization problem has a minimizer you can check whether the conditions of this uh, theorem are satisfied but again this part is a little more theoretical and it is not examinable i want us mainly to move on to the next section which is on the karush kuntaker or kkt theorem here are a few references you can use uh, if you want to dig deeper into the topic of uh, convex optimization so now the kkt theorem so far we have discussed only about convex optimization problems we have addressed the question of how to solve an unconstrained convex optimization problem of this form minimize a cost function f of x where f is a smooth function so how do we solve it we solve this equation to determine a stationary point we take the gradient and we s we set it equal to zero and as we have seen in a, in some cases like in the case of a quadratic function this equation is a linear equation and we can hopefully solve it or at least some software can solve it for us and once you have solved this equation you have determined a minimizer which is good news but what happens if you have a convex problem again and the problem looks like this minimize f of x but now you require that x belongs to a set x you have some constraints like some safety constraints as we discussed earlier what happens then we will focus on a particular family of uh, problems where the constraints have this form they have the form of an equation so some equality constraints need to be satisfied So consider the optimization problem minimize f of x subject to a bunch of constraints g1 of x is equal to 0 g2 of x is equal to 0 up to gp of x is equal to 0 this notation here means the numbers 1 2 3 up to p but i find this notation be a little more concise so we have a cost function and we have a bunch of uh, equality constraints equations 
And suppose that this is a convex problem and it is also feasible. What is the meaning of convex? What is the meaning of feasible? Convex here means not one but two things. The first one is that F is convex. The cost function is convex. And the second condition is that the set of constraints the set of constraints are convex. So when we say the set of constraints, we mean this set X of all the constraints. The set of points X in Rn such that these conditions Gj of X is 0 for all J from 1 to P. So this set is a convex set. I'll leave this to you as an exercise to verify that there is only one way for this set to be convex. This set is convex, x is convex, if and only if these functions g subscript j are affine, if these functions are affine. And what is an affine function? An affine function is a function that has this form Apologies for the bad handwriting, I'll write it again. If they are affine, if you can write them like this, gj of x is like ajx plus b subscript j. ajx plus bj. ax plus b, if the functions have this form. They must be simple enough. Now here is what we do in this case. You cannot simply say gradient of f is equal to zero. You cannot solve this equation because this equation disregards the constraints. What about the constraints? This is not a non-constrained problem. You have some constraints, these ones. You must take them into account. So what we do here is that with every constraint, every one of these, we associate a vector lambda j. Um, and so for every g, j equals 0, we associate a vector lambda j. This vector must have the same dimension as the function g, j. So, for example, if g, j of x has the form c transpose x plus d, which is real valued, this gives you a number, c transpose x is an inner product, it's a number, d, I'm telling you that d is also a number, then with that function you associate a number lambda j. This is what we will be focusing on actually mostly. Um, then define the vector of all lambdas and define the Lagrangian function which is a, think of it as a modification of the cost function. The Lagrangian function is a function of the original variable x and the auxiliary vector lambda. And it is defined as f of x plus the summation of these lambda j's transpose times g j. It will make sense in a moment when we'll solve a few examples. And here is the karosh kuntaker theorem that allows us to solve problems with equality constraints. So again, consider this optimization problem, f of x, minimize f of x, subject to a bunch of affine, as we said, constraints. Suppose that the problem is convex and feasible. I think we forgot to say what feasible is. Feasible means that, what does this mean? Feasible means that <coughs> these conditions can be satisfied. It means that there is at least one, there is a vector x or maybe x bar, let's call it x bar, there is a vector x bar in Rn such that all these conditions can be simultaneously satisfied. We're not asking for anything impossible, that's what feasible means. Okay. And suppose that there is a vector lambda star and a vector x star such that this is satisfied. The gradient of L now, not the gradient of F, the gradient of L 
is equal to zero. The gradient of the Lagrangian function is equal to zero. This is now what we will call a uh, sta stationary point. This is now what we will mean when we say sta a stationary point when it comes to problems with equality constraints. So then this x star is a minimizer. If this is satisfied, then x star is a minimizer. What about lambda star? Well, lambda star will not be something uh, useful to us. It is something useful, but we will not go into details. We are only interested in x star. So think of lambda as an auxiliary variable that we will not use any further. Once again, we associate a vector lambda j with every constraint gj of x is equal to zero. These vectors are known as the Lagrange multipliers. And let's have a look at an example for it to make sense. You want to minimize this cost function, one half norm of x squared. It is convex, it is smooth. And you have one, only one equality constraint, C transpose x is equal to 1, which I would like to write as C transpose x minus 1 is equal to 0. So you have one, only one equality constraint. This is your cost function f, and this is your constraint function g. You only have one. So step one, define this cost function f and define the constraints g of x is C transpose x minus 1. Step 2. Define the Lagrangian function, which is nothing but f plus lambda times g. This lambda, now here, because you have one constraint, this lambda, don't forget, is not a vector, it is just a number. And this is equal to, I'm just copying from above, 1 half norm of x squared plus lambda times g. Step 3. Now we want to find the minimizer, x star. We're looking for a lambda star as well, such that the gradient of uh, the Lagrangian is equal to zero. And the gradient of the Lagrangian now is given by the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to x and then the gradient with respect to lambda. Which, by the way, let me put an asterisk here, since lambda is a number, since lambda is a number, we're essentially talking about the derivative with respect to lambda of L evaluated at x comma lambda. So this is the derivative with respect to lambda. Let me move this a little up because you cannot see it there. So let's have a look now. What is the gradient of this function? What is the gradient of this function with respect to x? What is the gradient of this with respect to x? The gradient of this is equal to x. What about this? What is the gradient of this with respect to x? It is lambda times c. So let's have a look. x from here, lambda times c from here. So x plus lambda times c. And then what about the gradient or the derivative with respect to lambda? There is no lambda here, there is just one lambda here. So it is lambda times a number. So this number, C transpose x minus 1. This is the derivative of this function with respect to lambda. So here is our gradient. This is the vector of our gradient of L. So now we need to determine a pair x star lambda star such that the gradient of L is equal to zero. We need to solve this system of equations. So we have x star plus lambda star times c is equal to zero. And we have c transpose x star minus one is equal to zero. These conditions must be satisfied. From the first equation, we can solve for x star. So we solve, what we do is that we take the first equation, we solve for x star, and then what we do is that we substitute it into the second equation. And the second equation then becomes minus lambda star c transpose c minus 1 is equal to 0. So minus lambda star times c transpose 
actually sorry just a moment let me write it out for you it is c transpose x star minus one is equal to zero equivalently c transpose times what is x star from the first equation it is minus lambda star times c minus one is equal to zero and what i'm doing now is that because lambda star is just a number minus lambda star is just a number i'm taking minus lambda star and i'm moving it outside this expression it's just a number so you can put it whatever wherever you like i want to put it in the big at the beginning and i end up with minus lambda star c transpose c minus one is equal to zero which is beautiful now because i can solve for lambda star well i can solve for lambda star of course provided provided that c is not equal to zero because if c is equal to zero the denominator becomes zero but you know what it doesn't make much sense for c to be equal to zero because if c is zero and you go here you end up with zero transpose x is equal to one equivalently you end up with zero is equal to one and this problem is infeasible because you're imposing the condition zero is equal to one so it doesn't make sense for c to be equal to zero so once again we took this first equation we solved for x star we plugged x star into the second equation and from the second equation as you see we determined lambda star which is 50 percent of what we have to do now we have to determine x star but wait a second we know that x star is minus lambda star times c so there you go plug this inside here and you have x star so you, as i say here we may now plug this back into the first equation to obtain x star which is c divided by the norm of c squared that is really the solution of this optimization problem and we solved it by determining a stationary point by solving this equation the gradient of the Lagrangian is equal to zero and this is how the solution looks like uh, you have these gray contour lines which correspond to the cost function it is like you look at it from above you look at it from above in a way but you're not trying now to minimize the cost function alone because the minimum is clearly here at the center this is like a parabola these circles correspond to a parabola if you look at it from above the, this is what these contours uh, mean but you don't want to minimize uh, this function alone you want to minimize it on this line c transpose x is equal to one c transpose times x is equal to one this is your vector c it is take for example two minus one and this is c transpose x is equal to one so you're looking for a point on this line where this function becomes minimum and this point is this point x star well in this example it is 0 0.4 minus 0 0.2 just an illustration of the solution that's what this is and we can of course solve it in python using numpy that's me again so we can use numpy to solve it provide here your vector c whatever this is take for instance 0 0.4 minus 0 0.2 uh, you need to determine the squared norm then x star as we said before x star is equal to c divided by the squared norm of c note that look how we determine the squared norm we said that the squared norm of c is equal to the inner product of c with itself and p dot is the standard inner product of c with itself so it's useful to know that the squared norm is equal to the inner product of c with, with itself see it's very practical here and then x star is c divided by this squared norm which is a number and this defines your optimal this this defines your minimizer x star let's go back to the problem so this is the problem here this is the optimization problem and we determine that x star is equal to c over the norm of c squared 
This is the minimizer of the problem. However, one might ask, okay, then what is the optimal value? X star is where, at what point the best optimal minimum cost is attained. But what is that minimum cost? We'll simply take this X star and put it inside here. So the optimal value, often denoted by F star, is equal to one half norm of x star squared. If you want to substitute x star in this expression, this is absolutely fine, you can do it. We can also do it in Python, since we have determined x star, f star is one half times the squared norm, again, of x star with itself. So we can solve it Right, by writing our own code like this or we can give it to a library in Python and ask it to solve it for us. In that case we define C as a vector, we define X to be a variable, we define the objective function to be one half times the squared norm of X, in this case this sum of squares taken from the CVX pi library which is a a widely used library for convex optimization. So you see we define the objective function, then we define the constraints, then we define an optimization problem. We say that this is these are uh, th this is my objective, these are my constraints, and we ask Python to solve it. We don't have to do this here because we know how to solve this optimization problem is not extremely difficult. We can do it on paper like this, we, we determine the solution ourselves. But often, even for convex optimization problems, we cannot determine solutions on paper, we have to use software. So, you see here, you just write the problem, you provide the problem to Python as it is written on paper, you don't need to do anything more complicated. And then Python can solve it and give you, uh, CVXPy can solve it and give you the optimal value and the minimizer x star and the optimal value f star that's it really now with that we can try to solve some slightly more advanced problems namely equality constrained quadratic problems which are really like what we did here they are problems of this type but will generalize ever so slightly by replacing this cost function by a more general quadratic function will replace this constraint by a more general affine condition, a more general affine constraint. So now we will try to solve such a problem, minimize one half x transpose qx plus little q transpose x, and the constraints have the form ax equals b. We must assume that q is symmetric positive semi-definite, and A is just a matrix, we will impose some conditions later. Many, many problems in engineering can be represented by such quadratic problems. And let me mention just a few here. So we have least squares, least squares estimation, which is kind of uh, the bread and butter of statistics and machine learning to a great extent, not exclusively, but it's a very widely used method in uh, statistics and machine learning. We have linear quadratic optimal control problems, which is the subsequent section uh, in our module. We have problems, many problems in economics, such as the Markovitz problems, and even, even non-convex problems can be solved, approximated in a way, by solving a sequence of a series of quadratic problems. This is the famous sequential quadratic programming method. So quadratic programming is, without an exaggeration, ubiquitous in engineering, and it's really uh, important to, to have a look at how these problems can be solved, or whether they can be solved. The cost function here is this one. And the constraints are like this, affine constraints. We want this g to be equal to 0, ax minus b. Suppose also that the problem is feasible, so suppose that this equation, this linear system, can be solved. 
because okay it might not we might not be able to solve it so suppose that there is such an x bar such that a x bar is equal to b the Lagrangian function is equal to the cost function plus lambda transpose times ax minus b and if you take the gradient now with respect to x and with respect to lambda I must write gradient now because lambda is a vector in this case not a number then we end up with uh, this qx plus q plus a transpose lambda and ax minus b so I want now to determine the stationary point, in other words I want this to become equal to zero. We're looking for a pair of x star lambda star such that this is equal to zero and this is like equal to zero, ax star minus b is equal to zero, or I wrote it like this anyway. So now if we can solve this system of equations, which is a an equation, in x star comma lambda star I have two unknown vectors if I can solve it I can determine um, I can determine uh, a stationary point that is a minimizer of the problem I can write now this pair of equations like this you see q x star plus a transpose lambda star a transpose lambda star is equal to I'm taking this to the right hand side minus q and a x star is equal to b so this is really a linear equation this is a linear equation this is known actually as the kkt system of equations kkt stands for karush kun takir the names of the three people who came up with this methodology so now constrained quadratic problems of this type equality constrained quadratic problems boil down to solving a system of linear equations and then we can go on and we can we can move on to studying whether this system of equations has a solution whether the solution is unique under what conditions the solution is unique and so on uh, this matrix k here is known as the kkt matrix and it may or it may not be invertible very very often it is not invertible so one question we can ask is under what conditions this k is invertible, under what conditions this k is non-singular, and another condition we can ask is how we can solve this kkt system. One answer of course can be the obvious one, we can use software, although with an asterisk there, because in the last video of the series of video lectures on uh, linear systems, we highlighted the fact that we need to be careful when using software to solve linear equations because often we uh, receive erroneous results mainly because we tend not to read the documentation but uh, nevertheless we always need to keep in mind that there are three possibilities when it comes to solving linear systems one is that k is non-singular we have a unique solution the other possibility is that we have no solutions whatsoever and the third one is that the set of solutions forms an affine space um, as far as the second question is concerned we have two answers one is to use a numerical method to use software and the second possibility is to use the null space method which however we will not go into details but you can find you can find all the details in the in the lecture notes in the handouts. Um, in fact, these are things we covered in the linear algebra lecture, so I'm going to skip them for now. And I will only present to you this result, which, by the way, it is an exercise in a way because it's a it's a linear algebra exercise. But let me just say that this slide this slide is not examinable so from this section mainly I want you to know how what is the Karoshkun-Takir theorem what is the KKT theorem how to define the Lagrangian function and how to use it to solve simple quadratic problems and how to use it to derive the KKT equations which are these equations
So I want you to be able to, to come up to derive this set of uh, equations for this problem. This is what I want from you. This slide here, wait for it, this slide here is not examinable. Nevertheless, I think it's worth going through these very interesting conditions. So the following are equivalent. K is non-singular. The karushkin tucker matrix is non-singular. Is equivalent to the kernel of Q. Intersection with the kernel of A is trivial. Is equivalent to AX is equal to 0 and X is not equal to 0. Must imply that X transpose QX is positive and not 0. Uh, the next one is very, very useful. Let N span the kernel of A and we know very well that we can determine such a matrix N using software so let N be a matrix that spans the kernel of A then N transpose QN must be symmetric positive definite so this is a criterion we can use to, to test actually whether K is non-singular and the last question which is uh, again practical very practical uh, there must be a matrix C, which is positive, uh, symmetric positive semi-definite, such that Q plus A transpose C A is positive uh, definite. This is an exercise with an espresso index 3, which means that you have to consume at least 3 cups of coffee to solve it. Some of these equivalencies are simpler, some other ones like the last one are not extremely straightforward but uh, perhaps if you want to hone your linear algebra skills that's an excellent exercise to try uh, we will stop here because the null space method is not examinable either and i believe this concludes today's uh, video lecture yes that's it for now I have already prepared a recording for uh, this part, I'll send you a link. So thank you very much for watching, take care, goodbye.